In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dwini, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. So I'd like to ask you first, maybe if you can introduce who you are for the audience, maybe first time listening to you, who you are. Sounds good. So uh, my name is Pierre Thomas Brun. I'm an assistant professor in uh, at Princeton in uh, chemical engineering and chemical and biological engineering department. And um, I'm, you know, truthfully, some sort of a soft matter engineer. So soft matter, you know, everything that involves liquids or soft rubber like materials. Uh, that can undergo some large deformations. Um, and, uh, you know, I was trained as, a, let's say, applied mathematician. And so this provides essentially a, a nice toolbox to study the, the mechanics of these uh, liquids and uh, elastic materials. And I see these, you know, these uh, very intriguing uh, systems like pattern forming systems, for example, a little bit as an engineer. So, you know, the motivation to understand them is also to see how they can be applied. And uh, that led me to uh, soft robotics uh, in, in particular. Wonderful. So first of all, congratulations for your new paper. I think it's very beautiful work. And, uh, Thank you so much. and that's led me to be also a question. I think and I'm also very interested about geometric uh, nonlinearities and material nonlinearities. And firstly, uh, maybe the first question, how do you see the community? Because I think you have this background from mechanics and materials. But how do you see this kind of integration or understanding how geometric and material nonlinear both of them can give us interesting and complex functionalities? Do you think you understand them? What is really hard? I'm really curious about this point. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to give you a, my entry point to the problem. I don't know how you know generic or applicable to other people it is, but uh, I, I'm a very curious person. And uh, when I look around, in particular in nature, uh, you see that you have these really wonderful uh, materials that are functional materials and perform tasks you know, in acoustic, optics, or mechanics, for that matter, or functionalized surfaces. And uh, instead of relying on some sort of harsh chemistry or very specific answer, they really rely on uh, typically the structure of the material, right? So you have these um, architected materials that can perform some uh, very advanced functionalities uh, that essentially beat us, us being, you know, humans trying to build materials. And so that, that's what, you know, sort of triggered me. You know, you can think about, I don't know, honeycomb structures in, in our bones or, or things of the sort, right? And so uh, to me, I think that geometry is very robust, right? Uh, and so that's, 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 that's my, pr in, in, you know, that's my, let's say, take on the subject, right, is that if you find these geometrical feature, features sorry, that are very robust and provide interesting functions, then there is a natural drive for us engineers to try to replicate uh, these, these type of, uh, of materials. And uh, so, of course, I'm not the only one to do this. You know, there are plenty of people doing uh, this wonderful uh, uh, work on uh, architected materials and so-called metamaterials. And I guess that my specific, my specificity, let's say, my specific take on that is that, uh, you know, I come from fluid mechanics. And so the question is to me, how can we build these things in a robust way too, right? So not only we have these robust features, these robust materials uh, that will provide functionality, but we also find, we would like to also find a way to build them in a robust way too. Mm -hmm. right? So before going to the question, how we can extract this kind of useful information from certain geometry. Do you think which one is more like significant, the material nonlinearities or geometric nonlinearities when we try to using one structure? Which one is more interesting or maybe more dominant to give us more interesting functionalities? I think they, they, they work both ways, right? So when I, um, you know, before essentially joining Princeton, I, I was only working on linear elasticity. And since I'm here, uh, all I've done is uh, rubber-like materials, uh, and um, you know, as you know, they, they are highly nonlinear in the way they behave. And I think that uh, having also this type of linearity is very important. So if you think of uh, inflating a, a balloon, for example, you know, so we, if you uh, try to blow a balloon, uh, you will first have an elastic response of the material, and eventually you will reach like a plateau of pressure that will, you know, allow you to keep uh, inflating the balloon at uh, almost no cost, right? 
And this is very important um, because we probably don't have the lung capacity to keep you know, uh, deforming elastically uh, some materials. So I think this sort of interplay between uh, nonlinearities that come from geometry and nonlinearities that come from materials, uh, they don't have to be you know, competing, they can be working in, uh, together and uh, help us achieve you know, interesting functionality. Confused about the geometry in the paper, you, you mentioned about this kind of inspiration. For you, when you come with geometry, do you think you have to go always for intuition or looking for why we have evolution? If you can tell us a story behind the paper, how you approach this kind sure. of uh, I'm happy to, to provide this uh, info. So, you know, when it comes to soft robotics, uh, I think that's one interesting question we can ask ourselves is how can we uh, be frugal, right? So how can we have, for example, a limited number of pressure sources when we try to inflate these robots and still achieve like some, uh, some advanced functionality? So in some sense, I'm gonna send a pretty dumb signal, just an increase of pressure, and I'm gonna require my material to perform a task like you know, moving the fingers in an organized way. So these soft robots, by definition, they're inert, right? So there's no embarked electronics or anything like this. And so I want to be able to program the material. And to program the material, in our case, we, we thought that the, you know, we would like to, to shape carefully the inner void of the robot. Right? And so that's, I think, the, the interesting aspect of the research, which is shared with others, is the idea that we can encode some intelligence or some programmation of the robot at the materials level. And in this case, by uh, deciding of the shape of the cross-section of our robot, so the inner void. And I guess the peculiarity of our approach, which is quite unique, is that this is done by using the rules and tools of fluid mechanics and not by having some complex molding system. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. But you still think about the design in general, uh, because I think in co-design and soft robotics, we speak about co-design and how we come up with kind of complex, yeah, for example, using different material and making certain geometry so that you can have something interesting. For you, do you think optimization, because you also have this background do you think in co-design how we can use the morphology and architecture and the other side, this kind of digital computation here? How do you see the merging of two? Yes, yeah, so I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not an expert in uh, you know, optimization techniques or, or you know, things of the sorts, but I think that the, the, the reason why soft robotics as a whole is working is because it's the convergence of many different approaches, right? So there is like, uh, improvements not only in the conceptual aspects, right? So let's say mechanics or uh, computer graphics, but also in the practical side, right? So these days, it's reasonably easy to have access to a 3D printer, to laser cutter, and you have these elastomers that are readily available. So it's, it's really the fact that all these fields are pushing at the same time. So of course, you can try to make improvements by uh, you know, being a specialist in uh, maybe tessellated surfaces or origami or something like this. So this is not my specialty, so I cannot pretend I'm going to be able to, to push necessarily in this direction. But I saw that for me there was an opportunity to jump in uh, at the fluid mechanics level and also at the elasticity level, right? So something that is uh, sometimes a little bit frustrating is the requirement of uh, long computations, let's say, you know, uh, using... Um, finite elements, for example, right? So they're, they're, they're wonderful tools. We have used finite elements, but uh, I see them as, uh, you know, essentially numerical experiments. So you have an initial set of conditions and then you have a result. The question is, you know, how do you generate, like a, a generate knowledge based on this type of, uh, of, of simulations? And um, in our case, we, we I mean, it's, it's a happy accident in some sense, but the, the y y we can, uh, essentially condensates all the information about the morphing of the structure by changing the natural curvature of the object. So we have essentially rods that don't have to be straight, but they're rods. And as we inflate them, we can change the natural curvature. And so if you see now these robots as essentially a, a collection of uh, elastic rods, you can apply well-known equations like the Kirchhoff equations, which are much easier to integrate than uh, the full-fledged uh, models that you would need to, to do the deformation of these robots tr traditionally, right? And so on that side, it's also a win because you have access to this simple model and who says simple says that it can be, it's almost analytically tractable, which means that you can do the reverse engineering or the reverse design much more easily than with the traditional, uh, traditional robots in, in, in that sense.
But I'm just given this process. I don't know if we have something was surprising, but sometimes we design something and we go to the lab and we find something. This is a really interesting result. And just to bring to our mind that maybe there's something very interesting here. I don't know if you have in this pro something was like surprising or discovered something. I mean, the, the, in this case, the whole thing was a surprise, right? Because they, of course we never intended to do uh, this bubble testing process the way it was. It's, uh, I, I, I went in the lab and uh, as many PI might do, I messed up something. <laughs> so I was trying to, you know, essentially uh, build some some uh, elastic air by pushing some elastomer into a tube and I accidentally also injected the bubble and uh, I guess the the you know the the analytic part of me was then curious to see oh how does this bubble look like because I have this background in you know fluid mechanics and everything that involves uh, interfacial fluid mechanics is interesting to me and we had recently worked also on the drainage of elastomer on curved surfaces, so I figured, oh, okay, actually it looks like it. And it looks like the, you know, the, there is this cross-section, the top part of the cross-section of our robots uh, is this sort of thin layer that we can probably predict uh, uh, using the same tools we have uh, you know, developed in the past for, for these type of flows. And uh, then we, you know, we inflated it and it started to curl and said, okay, that's, that might be interesting to, to do something about it. And I had this uh, wonderful student, Trevor Jones, who, who was uh, starting his PhD. So I told him, you know, why don't you think about it and, and let's see how, where it goes. And so four years down the road, it, it led to this publication. So this, this project started completely accidentally. Mm -hmm. And this is something, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to elaborate on that. that that's something which, uh, on my personal journey, that's, uh, you know, I started as someone who was doing mostly theory. And then I, I got to meet like uh, a bunch of expert, uh, excellent experimentalists and I was always a little bit jealous in that I felt that you know, they were discovering stuff and I was trying to help explain after they discovered. So I thought maybe I can also jump the gun and now try to discover something myself. And, and so the, that's the rationale as to why when I started here, I, I also decided to have a lab, which I think for the types of problem that uh, I'm doing is an excellent source of, uh, you know, um, uh, intriguing observations that turn that can turn into interesting problems, right? So, this sort of back and forth between theory and experiments, I think, is very uh, stimulating, and um, and I'm quite attached to 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 these aspects. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I think maybe a quick question here about these ideas because you mentioned something I think very interesting about discovering something completely unexpected. Are you afraid about this kind of risk? Because sometimes there's a trendy that you avoid this risk ideas, maybe some people will not understand it. I don't know if you have this kind of fear sometimes, maybe the community will not get what I'm saying, or it's kind of thoughts you have, or you didn't have this kind of moment, yeah. That's I mean, I, I didn't, and then I did. <laughs> so in some sense, I, I never thought about it because this is something which is a bit natural to me, right? So I just think of something, I try to build a puzzle around it, and I try to solve it myself, right? Which is in some sense, in a nutshell, what we do as a researcher. But then as a faculty, of course, you're, you're sort of asked to, uh, you know, build maybe a more rational umbrella of, of, uh, of problems. So Princeton is a wonderful place in that they, you know, give me complete freedom into doing, uh, you know, pretty much uh, whatever I want in terms of, you know, um, intellectual freedom. But you still need to fund your research. So for funding research, you, you, I think it's important to present like a, a coherent uh, a program and I was one day giving a, a, um, a presentation to the panel, a panel, and and uh, this question was, you know, sticking to me is that this person said, "Okay, it's wonderful, very inspiring, but is there a method to the madness?" Right. So, and uh, and I, 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 you know, that's that sort of bugged me a little bit, and I think it's uh, I, I try now to be a little bit more uh, methodic in the way I, I pick the problems. And I think it's also important for mentoring, right? Because the, this sort of juggling with, uh, with concepts and problems can be a bit uh, difficult for, for students when they first get started because it's, 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 it can be a bit frightening. And so I'm, I'm trying to be uh, sometimes a little bit more grounded in, in how I pick the problems and uh, sort of the, the, the path that I'm trying to follow, at least with the grad students. The postdoc is a different story because they come with their backgrounds, they come with their ideas and... Um, and they, they have a bit more of a, you know, carte blanche to, to explore yeah. whatever they might uh, fancy. Maybe I'm just asking about your inspiration. I think when you 
highlight about this how how this kind of design inspires form evolution. And to be honest, I find that's very intriguing how this designs already how evolution can come up with such design like that. Example in creatures, they have the kind of multi-material or certain shape. Why have the shape? For music experience, that when you look for examples, do you think why the shape like that? Or sometimes still you don't understand why this design looks like maybe an evolution and you want to replicate something, you think maybe you get something very interesting or maybe you don't understand yet. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm uh, more, you know, generally appealed to problems that I don't understand, right? So I think for me, it's really the, the bugging aspect, right? So I see something, it sort of connects with, of course, concept that I, you know, appreciate or understand. And I say, based on what I know, I still don't get that thing, right? And so that's, that's I think, for me, the incentive to, to dig a bit further and, and try to see if there is, uh, you know, some, some more subtle subtlety in something that appears maybe a bit mundane or, or trivial, right? I first started working on, you know, my, my PhD project was on the coiling of viscous threads, right? So this is the definition of something which is mundane, but actually is extremely difficult to solve. Uh, in in uh, an applied math point of view. Uh, maybe I'm curious about the instabilities. Uh, and I'm curious to ask you how you can leverage this kind of something, maybe view it as uh, maybe not positive, and sometimes you get a void. Uh, this, this kind of concept, how we use instability. Uh, can you tell a bit more how you can use something, maybe view it as something maybe not positive for commonly, traditionally, but you try to use it in a, in a very interesting way? Yes. So yesterday I was actually teaching in uh, something called squishy engineering, and and uh, I, I made this uh, recurrent joke, which yesterday worked well. <laughs> so, but I, I show instabilities, you know, in mechanics, right? So you know the fluttering of a wing, or the buckling of railway, or the collapse of a tank, you know. So this is usually very negative in in uh, mechanical engineering or civil engineering, right? So because it, it typically means that there will be dramatic failure in the structure. So. And as a result, these, these, uh, these instabilities, especially in mechanics, in, in solid mechanics, sorry, they have been mostly studied uh, in order to try and avoid them, right? And so I asked the, the, the classroom, you know, how can you turn something bad into something good? And the answer is to make an ice cream out of it, right? So uh, there is this, this brand of ice cream, it's called Vienita ice cream. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's, it's a pretty standard vanilla ice cream as a cake, but in between two, the top and bottom uh, sandwiches, there is this wavy pattern. And the wavy pattern comes from a buckling instability uh, in, the, in the fabrication lane, right? So they have a, a nozzle where they inject ice cream at a given velocity on a belt, and the belt doesn't move as fast as the injection. And so as a result, there is a buckling instability. So sometime, if you can harness instabilities, it's good. <laughs> Uh, in the case of ice cream. And I think in, in fluid mechanics, we have uh, a bit more this, uh, this habit of actually playing with instabilities. So if you think of everything involving droplets, uh, I don't know, inject printing, microfluidics, all that stuff is relying on the really, tail or really plateau instability, right? So the breakup of uh, a thread into a collection of drops. And so I think that in, in fluid mechanics, uh, there is this habit of you know, using interfacial flow and uh, to fabricate drops, for example. But this is, in, in the end, a very tiny thing, that, a tiny part of the whole library of you that you have in instabilities in fluid mechanics. And so my lab is sort of exploring how we can actually tap into all these big reservoirs to fabricate interesting structures. And uh, this leads to cool problems because you have these sort of traditional fluid mechanics, which is usually using Newtonian fluids, right? So whether it's water or silicon oil, right? Those, those fluids are typically Newtonian. But now you mix this uh, traditional fluid mechanics with actually uh, fluids that are a bit more extreme in that they can uh, cool down or they can polymerize and, and form like a tangible structures. And so this interplay between uh, uh, fluid mechanics and solid mechanics, because the outcome will be solid, I find very appealing. And on the, the fundamental side, you're adding one more time scale in the problem, which is the, the curing time scale, the cooling time scale. And so you know these problems are already highly nonlinear and highly complex, and so adding one more ingredient can actually lead to surprising results. And so that's, that's the type of thing that we're interested in in, in my group, and that I find uh, extremely satisfying because uh, you, I mean, I think everyone who, is in, who appreciates fluid mechanics like this sort of, you know, uh, 
nice and smooth uh, looking structures that you have in fluid flows. And now these days, you know, we have these high speed cameras that are very cool because you can capture this thing, but still, it's still digital, right? And with, uh, with this, uh, the, the, the fact that you have these fluids that actually are curing or cooling down, this uh, previously unattainable type of structures, you can actually touch them and grab them in your hand, right? So as a matter of fact, let me show you something. This is like, this is glass, right? So this was molten glass. It led to these sort of coiling structures. But now I can grab it and I can hold it with my hand, which is, I find it very cool. And so this sort of, you know, uh, interplay between, again, fluid flows, curing, and uh, leading to these structures, I find very, uh, uh, very um, satisfying, intellectually speaking, and intriguing because of this sort of uh, texture of the materials we have. And ultimately, this could be uh, interesting in engineering because you're all of a sudden turning these uh, fluid things into solid structures, right? So this naturally connects to additive manufacturing, really, right? So it's just another way of saying how you can manufacture goods, not, not using uh, molds or constraints, but using actually uh, fluid flows and interfaces to shape structures. I'm just ask you when you look to maybe soft robotics field, or maybe in general, what do you think maybe something maybe missing um, in the research, and maybe we don't give much attention or focus? Why well, I'm asking this question because I, I feel sometimes we don't touching the real question. Sometimes I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm curious about your point of view. Do you think we touching the real question that push the field forward? Like you mentioned this example now. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, you know. I, I worked a little bit uh, on, f on uh, soft robotics in some sense, right? I'm not an expert. And I also worked uh, in uh, another field, which is uh, microfluidics. And so those two fields have a few things in common. It doesn't look like it's uh, when you first think about it, but the, the one thing they have in common first and foremost is maybe they use the elastomers to build stuff, right? So PDMS or other kinds of elastomers. And, but but the, the, the other point I want to get at is that they... Um, often, not all soft robots, of course, but most soft robots these days uh, rely on pressure sources. And, you know, th these are these uh, syringe pumps, for example. And it's the same thing for uh, um, microfluidics, right? They have these pressure sources. And I think that these two fields are somehow trying very hard to uh, actually get rid of these uh, uh, syringe pumps, right? And, and the reason is that, you know, we're... we're saying, okay, these soft robots are wonderful because they're compliant, they're lifelike. Uh, again, same thing for microfluidics. You know, there's a tiny structures. Uh, usually when you have a, a micro channel, you, you take a, a nickel uh, next to it to show how small it is. But we should have forget that there, there are tubes that are connecting these uh, structures with these like uh, big and bulky and pricey syringe pumps, right? So I think, uh, I don't know how big a deal it is, big of a deal it is, but I think if we want to distribute these objects into our daily lives, uh, we might want to, uh, you know, get rid of these uh, fancy uh, equipments like syringe pumps and bulky equipments and try and find, like, uh, more robust ways to actuate these, these things. So people, of course, are, are working on it in, in, in both fields, but I think this is a very important uh, part of this, uh, of this problem. You know, it's, it's always... Uh, we're doing things which, you know, potentially can apply to uh, and, and transform our daily lives. Uh, but we have to ask ourselves, you know, what are the, the barrier for this transition, for, for these applications? And that's maybe something that uh, we as uh, fundamental researchers sometimes um, try to avoid thinking about, which can have this, uh, you know, effect where you're eventually you have a niche of, uh, you know, people researching around the theme, but that's become a bit disconnected to reality. So I think, you know, soft robotics is very connected to reality, but as the field is growing and becoming, uh, you know, uh, maturing further, it, it should try and keep connecting to the, you know, original goal of, and um, um, that's, you know, just one example, this uh, syringe pump business. <laughs> I have nothing against the uh, manufacturers of syringe pumps, of course. But. That's excellent point. I'm curious to also ask you about physical intelligence in that case, because you what you're doing already, I think, in that scope and embodied intelligence in the material. How do you see the balance between using, I think that's a question of robotics, physical intelligence and exhibiting intelligence through, for, for example, nonlinear geometry, and other side using 
control or, or something to force the material to behave in a certain behavior. Because I think the question how we embed the sensing and the other side, how we can have kind of physical intelligence, how do you see the interplay here between physical intelligence in the geometry, material non-energies, or maybe external controller and sensing? How do you see this, yeah, this loop here going from your experience? No, it's a good question. Um... I'm not sure. I, I mean, I'm, I'm always a bit, you know, ambivalent because, of course, uh, this idea of, you know, exploiting, let's say, uh, nonlinearities in the materials to build some uh, intelligence are, uh, you know, very interesting and, and appealing to some extent. Uh, but as always, because this is new or, you know, in, term, in, in the course of development, the uh, overall results is, of course, uh, not as good as the existing thing in, in you know, controllers or more electronic-based uh, structures. And so part of me really wants to believe in it and say I think we would need to really embed this intelligence at the materials level, which doesn't rely on uh, applied currents, electronics, uh, harsh chemistry. And part of me sometimes thinks, uh, you know, actually you can do all kinds of very interesting with an Arduino board that uh, maybe we should not, you know, close our eyes on the fact that uh, this also exists. Um, but uh, on, on my end, we're trying very hard to, uh, you know, put the constraints of not using uh, anything else than essentially one pressure source trying to uh, inflate uh, uh, our robots, right? So, but we have the benefit to do it because we're working in uh, this sort of idealized setting and, uh, Again, still academic research. Of course, if, if you're an engineer trying to actually build something in a prescribed time scale, I think you have to use whatever is available, and that includes, of course, the uh, controllers and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, if you can mention the limitation, maybe sometimes the work we have limitation. Do you have any kind of limitation, something you want to push forward again in the current paper, maybe? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, of course, the, you know, we have like the, our approach has some some limitations. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm very. Uh, let's <laughs> disclose something that, uh, you know, we have a Slack channel and I have this this channel uh, called uh, Life Without VPS, right? So because all we do is using this sort of rubber like type VPS, uh, which is a great polymer, uh, great for us because it cures reasonably fast and has a nice like rheology that we can capture well um, analytically. Uh, but somehow it's, you know, one can look a bit around and uh, try and find some, some, other, uh, some other elastomers to play with. And by this I, m I mean that, um, you know, our, our approach in the, in the paper is uh, very passive in that, you know, gravity is essentially doing the whole work. And uh, the curing of the polymer initiates when you're making, mixing both reagents, but then as soon as it started it's, it's going on uh, and doesn't stop. And so I think that you know one possible uh, improvement would be to use, for example, UV curable polymers, right? Where you could come and locally cure uh, your el elastomers at given places. So I think you know by this I mean that if you add more knobs into your problem, whether it's UV curable stuff or maybe some uh, magnetic particles uh, that you can control using magnetic fields, or you know, so these these type of additional ingredients can, of course, enrich uh, the physical landscape and can provide like more uh, advanced functions, right? So since the question, I have a question maybe, I'm curious about to ask you about mechanics because I think sometimes there's a problem in soft robotics, it's really hard to solve analytically or mechanics. Do you have any kind of take about understanding, how understanding mechanics could help in designing, or because sometimes we go, we neglect this part sometimes, it's so challenging, especially maybe in soft robotics. I don't know if you agree with that or not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so I think it's, uh, it's a very important point, is that the, um, you know, the, the more you understand the mechanics of the object, the, the more you might be able to design uh, things in a, in, a, in a clever way, right? So, uh, Pushing the boundaries of uh, of mechanics, whether it's uh, uh, elastic rods, shells, or or other kind of uh, objects, uh, is I think very important to uh, serve then the, the the engineering community at large that involves you know of course soft robotics. Um, 
I'm a specialist of elastic rods, and uh, and that's great because I'm you know I think that uh, more uh, th th there are exist like more complex objects like uh, essentially shells, for example, where the the math is much more intricate than uh, when you have just a, a one D object, and uh, you know. Indeed, uh, I, I, I firmly believe that the more we understand fundamentally about these, uh, these kind of uh, maybe um, idealized uh, problems, the more we'll be able to um, you know, design complex um, um, functions using um, predictive principles, right? So uh, not just trial and error, but rather uh, having like some um, you know, models that uh, allow us to decide um, um, of the, you know, the, the overall structures of, of our robots. Great, yeah. And I'm curious also, how would you deal with doubt as a researcher? <laughs> if you have a moment of doubt, how do you deal with that? Oh, doubt. <laughs> uh, you better deal well with it because I think it's the basics of, of our job, right? To, to doubt uh, in, in the in the sort of a permanent state of doubt and confidence at the same time, right? So this is a bit of this uh, paradoxical state where uh, you know that you don't know, but you know that you're happy with, with the fact that you don't know, right? So uh, that's my way of dealing with it. Uh, it's somehow, I think, easier as you, you grow older. Uh, not that we're, not that I become wise or wiser at all, but I think that because I diversify essentially what I do and have more, you know, research projects at the same time, uh, this is a good way to sort of mitigate disappointment in some sense. And so that's what I tell my students also, is that it's, uh, you don't want to bet uh, everything on, on one horse. And so I think that when they're doing their research, it's always good to have some, a few parallel tracks to uh, sometimes have some, um, you know, good surprises on things that they, they didn't expect and make it okay that some things are a bit more uh, disappointing, right? So I think managing your... Um, your uh, essentially happiness is uh, a central uh, skill and a central task of um, as a researcher, and and I firmly believe that you know of course uh, there will be ups and downs, right? So you have to be prepared for the downs, and uh, and there is nothing wrong with that, and it's probably because you're uh, facing something which is difficult, and or well, difficult. Another way of saying is ambitious, and uh, and you know keep keep working on it uh, until it, it, it pans out. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, I think maybe two questions left. The first one, maybe, um, what kind of future do you envision for the work you do? For example, the paper, where do you, your aspiration you want this work to reach? Like maybe in, in, as a project, I don't know what's your aspiration here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, when it comes to soft robotics, they're like super uh, interesting applications for the human uh, robot interaction right so uh, seeing our robots applied to some of these uh, you know um, applications would be would be great right so that's something that we're trying to work on too is to see whether you know we can bring our our actuators uh, to um, uh, you know more more applied uh, um, uh, settings so whether we're talking about um, you know, maybe medical or uh, um, just like, um, you know, gripping objects and, and things. So, so seeing that the, this research is not just like a, an interesting idea, but can also be uh, um, applied by others in, in, in some more um, um, applied settings. So I think I've said applied many times in this <laughs> sentence. So that means that I'm really interested in, in seeing it applied. Uh, and, you know, the other thing is, I, I think that, you know, soft matter is a very interesting uh, field. Uh, and we have now the basics of principles that allow us to design shape morphing structures, uh, usually at a, a reasonably uh, small scale, right? So, and, and at these small scales, whether they're really small and gravity doesn't matter, or whether you make it such that gravity doesn't matter, being, you know, for example, neutrally buoyant or things like this, uh, it's very convenient. But uh, something that I'm interested in is trying to see whether we can uh, scale up these principles, right? So whether we can apply uh, these shape morphing ideas to have larger scale structures where gravity starts to play a role. 
it's a, one of the things that we received funding for uh, recently in an advanced manufacturing grant is to try and see whether we can have, um, you know, architectural structures, real arch architectural structures, right? So bridges and and such uh, being built using this sort of, uh, you know, shape morphing principles that come from soft matter. And so I think this is a big challenge. I don't, I don't say that I have the answer, but we're definitely trying to see whether how we can generate essentially large forces uh, using this sort of uh, soft robot approach or soft matter approach, which is sort of paradoxical because I've said soft and I've said large forces, right? So uh, whether there are strategies to uh, essentially make these two uh, concepts um, um, work in pair. Mm -hmm. Maybe, uh, one question about this point about the design. Do you think there's a trade-off that maybe you can avoid sometimes? Because sometimes we speak of robotics about unavoidable trade-offs in that case. Do you have any something you still maybe aspire to close a trade-off in a certain aspect? Yeah, I mean, I think, you, yeah, as you said, you know, there, there are always like some, some trade-offs. Uh, but that could be maybe strategies that, that will allow you to, allow you to sort of alleviate uh, some of the issues that you're running into. Um, and to be uh, candid, I don't think we can alleviate these limitations everywhere, right? But there could be some particular applications where these limitations could be uh, lifted. It's, as an intrinsically lazy person, I'm also working towards more those ones that are potentially solvable rather than the ones that I think are, yeah. are harder to tackle. So what advice was given to you and was life changing? Maybe it's your career or, yeah, stick to your mind, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful, of course, uh, when I look back. Uh, I mean, I'm not that old, <laughs> but I can still look back a little bit and see that I've been very, uh, uh, very lucky in the, the mentorship I have received uh, throughout the years. And, uh, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm very... Uh, obviously, um, you know, very happy and, and very um, uh, grateful that I've received these, these memberships, uh, these me sorry, these mentorships sorry, uh, throughout the years. And I also realize this is not the case for everyone, right? There, there are so many, like, stories in, in science and of uh, difficult times that are faced in, in uh, some, um, you know, unpleasant environments. So that makes me even more grateful that I, you know, somehow never had to to face this this type of hardships. Um, but I think, you know, the the, the when I was at uh, MIT be, before joining Princeton, uh, that was really a pivotal time for me, uh, where I I realized that you know my background actually could be applied in in all kinds of directions. And that's, uh, you know, I think it was uh, okay to be essentially ambitious about uh, problems and, and, uh, and innovation. Um, and so, you know, this, this is uh, something I've learned with people like uh, Pedro Reis uh, when he was still at MIT. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, many of the things I've used, I use today, I, I also owe to, uh, uh, my, my uh, PhD advisors, I had two, so this is a, always a good thing, I guess. And, um, and you know, the, the technical skills I've developed during this PhD are still tools that I'm using uh, and trying to pass on uh, to, to my students these days. So, um, you know, this, this is um, uh, something I'm, uh, of course, I'm very grateful about this. Wonderful, yeah. I don't know if you have any final words you'd like to say for the robotics community who will be listening. Any final words you'd like to say? Final words, wow, that's, I, I did not think about that at all. Um, no, I mean, I, you know, like I said, I think it's, uh, uh, um, I'm very, uh, you know, interested in this sort of uh, soft matter uh, topic. I think there is, uh, this is a very, um, you know, potentially impactful uh, um, area of science. And, uh, these days, it's timely too, right, to think about uh, uh, how to uh, maybe uh, rethink the way we're manufacturing goods. And uh, I think it's also encouraging for um, the mechanics community at large to think that, you know, the, um, 
uh, mechanics is still a very uh, lively and very uh, um, um, you know uh, important topic and uh, while you know some others would would like to think that this is maybe a science of the past I think it's very much a science of uh, of today and for, of tomorrow and so this is will be my, my message that I don't don't give up on <laughs> Uh, on studying difficult topics in, in mechanics because this is, uh, uh, we realize more and more that mechanics play an important role uh, even in, you know, in, in biology and, uh, and this is a, a part of knowledge that, that should be, uh, you know, treasured and, and maintained. And so I think as, as a community, uh, we have to essentially fight, fight for it and, um, and you know, um, keep pushing in, in the in, in these like novel uh, directions. That's very important and I, I would like to thank you once again. It's very inspiring and great work and with such a pleasure to have you on the podcast. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you very much. That that was that was new to me. <laughs> Hopefully I did okay. Uh, I was very uh, very humble to be invited and uh, it was a, a great experience for me. Thank you very much uh, for, for the invitation. Thank you.